So now we're going to talk a little bit. This is sort of the last little piece uh, related specifically to wellbore stability. And we can't really do calculations here because the models get too complex really for the scope of this class. But um, we'll show you what you could do if you, you know, or if you're interested in or uh, if you want to, if you stay here for graduate school and you want to take my advanced geomechanics course, the kind of things that we do in that class. So uh, th this is a, a case study that Zoback refers to in several places in the book, and it has to do with uh, this project at the Cook Inlet in Alaska. And you know, here the, the ultimate question is, do they case the well or not case the well, and specifically in a location when they were where they had a main borehole and they were kicking off multiple horizontals, and so they were trying to know, do we need to case all of these horizontals or not? You know, because of course, if you can not do it, you save money. Um, <clears throat> and so the first thing they did, and there's actually nothing new here, uh, the first thing they, well, I say they did, uh, they didn't actually do this. This, the, they went and drilled these wells. Uh, and, the, and the sort of uh, the case study was done afterwards to say, well, if we had a fully, you know, if we had a fully informed geomechanical model, what, how could we have done this better? Right? So we're trying to learn from the mistakes. So in this case, uh, you know, what you see on the left is just, uh, you know, sort of what we've done. Uh, the, the, the color contours represent, you know, basically uh, red. I mean, as it says in the plot, I don't read it to you, but red is is less stable regions and, and the blue are more stable regions. And so if you compare that to a couple of wells that were drilled, uh, namely, so this is oriented uh, in, in uh, the cardinal directions. Th these two figures are oriented the same way. And so if you look at the well that was drilled here uh, in this direction, which you know over here would be, you know, uh, out, it would be plotted out here somewhere, right? Uh, and in this case, after the fact, they built this uh, plot, and what they found that you know where they were predicting more stable wells, uh, in fact, for this well that I traced here in red, they had no problems at all with stability. There was no breakouts, nothing like this. Um, however, in the other well, it was just the opposite. So, in this well, uh, which would be you know out here somewhere. Or you know, I think these are horizontal wells ultimately, so they'd really be at the end. Um, but in this case, they, they did in fact encounter all sorts of wellbore stability problems, just like the model predicted. So, uh, so if they'd had the geomechanical model or the information up front, then they would have known this, and they, they could have known, you know, to either not drill in that direction or in the kickoffs uh, into this regions that were less stable, then they knew that they would need casing um, and um, a sufficient amount of casing. So the next thing is then, uh, it's, it's sort of an aside, but it also has to deal with the kind of strength things that we've looked at, was uh, to know exactly where to kick off. So you, you want to kick off in regions uh, of high rock strength, again, for stability issues. Uh, so what they did was they took core samples uh, during the drilling process, and then, and again, after the fact, uh, they were able to do a bunch of mechanical testing in the laboratory, and they were able to develop this empirical relationship, um, uh, this empirical relationship for the unconfined compressive strength as a function of some of the reservoir parameters. So. Uh, the pressure wave speed and the density, and you know, I, I we see these things a lot in in uh, kind of petroleum engineering, very empirical relationships, and I'm not a big fan of them. But you know, in the absence of being able to do anything else, then you have to do something. You, you kind of do what you can. So uh, you know, the reason this is not um, all that useful is because it's very limited to the sort of that reservoir in that place. Uh, you can't really, it's not a deep understanding of the physical nature of rocks, and therefore you can't extrapolate it to, you know, a rock that has a little more carbon and a little more clay, whatever, right? Uh, so it's sort of a, a one-time 
second shot at, to get this kind of information. But again, in the absence of the ability to do anything smarter, uh, you do what you can. And if you go back to uh, chapter four, where we were talking about rock strength, there's a table there with uh, a whole bunch of these different types of relationships. Uh, and this one uh, has to do with, uh, if you go back and look at the, the title, it, it was related to the Cook Inlet. So the same exact uh, well we're talking about here. So now you sort of know which directions are safe to drill and at which, which heights, uh, you know, the, because of the rock strength, it's sort of safe to kick off at. And so then the last kind of thing that you need to know in terms of uh, bringing this swell into production or, you know, answering that question, do we need to case it or not, has to do with sand production. So, uh, you know, s sand production is basically, uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it doesn't necessarily mean you're producing sand uh, in the sense that, like, quartz, right? I mean, it's, you're just flowing back the reservoir during production, and that pressure drawdown associated with the flowback can cause the wellbore to fail, because now you don't have all the drilling mud and the other uh, stability things you can do for, for stabilization. So uh, that drawdown can cause the wellbore to fail uh, and to produce sand. You know, this is the, the industry terminology, so sand production. So um, unfortunately, you know, this is really where it gets beyond the scope of this class because uh, the tools to do a, an analysis of sand production is really you have to do these with a computer with a finite element or some type of numerical simulator because uh, in, in order to understand this you need to use these complex constitutive failure models uh, the ones that we you know talked about in a, in a general sense but you also have to take into account the fact that the pressure is flowing through the material right so uh, the, the fluid pressure, you know, it's flowing through the material and it's it's dynamically changing, and of course then that affects dynamically affects the stress and the rate at which you draw it down can also affect the strength of the material. So in other words, you know if you're flowing the material, um, I mean if you're if you're drawing it down quickly, um, the, the pressure gradients near the wellbore can be fast because the fluid doesn't have you know as much time to to diffuse, and so then you get Pressure, high pressure gradients near the well bore, and that's sort of what's uh, exhibited in this figure on the on the left. Uh, he doesn't actually give, you know, what you'd probably have to go read the paper to to know what he means by slow. But I think the idea is just to compare the two. So these were numerical simulations of, uh, you know, a, a 500 psi drawdown slowly versus a thousand psi drawdown rapidly, and you can see, I mean, the idea here. This is a three-dimensional uh, kind of surface plot of pressure contours, and, and the idea is you can see that the, the, you know, the gradient, the change in the pressure contour near the wellbore, um, first of all, is in the, slow, in the 500 psi slow drawdown case, it's, it's a much kind of shallow gradient as, as compared to the steeper case. Um, but also the maximum and minimum pressure. So these the color bars are, are plotted on the same axis. So, you know, here on this plot, you're essentially in this region uh, of pressures, whereas, you know, on this one, you're, you're basically at the maximum and minimum. And in those two cases, as if you look at uh, the failure of the wellbore and uh, then and do a prediction of the breakouts via the failure model, then in this 500 psi slow drawdown case, <coughs> you have something like, you know, on the order of breakouts that are on the order of 60 degrees uh, versus over here you have, you know, breakouts that are greater than 90 degrees. And so with more breakouts, the total volume of sand produced is going to be greater, of course. <coughs> and so, you know, these are done with uh, fully coupled poroelastic simulators that also include models of inelasticity, so these are, you know, the most, the simplest one is, is your more Coulomb, but uh, they can go, you know, all the other ones we talked about. And <clears throat> in the next, in the next case, uh, you'll see a terminology, something called plastic strain. So if you remember back when we look at, you know, stress strain curves, 
uh, you know, a typical pl uh, a typical stress strain curve for a rock under confinement will, you know, look something like this maybe, or or possibly like this or like this. So, um, you know, so this this region beyond this region beyond where you have elasticity. So, again, if I'm over here. and I load up or strain my material, if I get, as long as I stop before this point and I unload it, I'm going to come right back down where I started, right? But if I continue up into this plastic region, and, you know, again, we use the word plastic loosely. It's a rock, right? It's not, it's not actually deforming, but, uh, you know, through the way plastics do, uh, or cr even metals. Um, but, so, you know, I guess technically you'd say inelasticity. But nevertheless, I mean, the idea is that if I load up into this region and then I unload, then there's going to be some permanent strain there. And, and so that, that permanent strain is the plastic strain. And so we typically have failure models that will, you know, based on experiments and other data, that will tell you that, you know, there's some acceptable value of plastic strain uh, before then you'll produce sand. And so in the, in the next few plots, you'll see, you know, some, some critical value, some, say, critical value of plastic strain could be on the order of, like, 50%. You know, if, if we exceed this, and the only way to do this is in numerical simulation, but if we, do, if we exceed this, then we'll produce that sand, and, and we can get estimates of volume of produced sand and other things.